Good evening, brothers and sisters and visitors alike, friends of the congregation. Glad to have everyone here with us this evening. Uh, it's been a little rainy day, but uh, it's been good. Especially been good to know that uh, Jasmine Rutledge amongst us tonight. We are so proud of her. She obeyed the gospel earlier this morning, put on her Lord and our Savior as well, Jesus Christ in baptism. And she is the daughter of Yolanda Darden and the granddaughter of Rosa Darden. So she is standing up there for those of you that were not here this morning. And she is our new sister in Christ. So proud of you, Jasmine. And I'm also reminding us of upcoming events. Brother Aubrey shared with us this morning the September 19th mobile drive through food pantry. Uh, he also reminded us that the truck will arrive at 7 a.m. bright and early and we'll need many volunteers. And uh, I'm not concerned about this because we always have people here. And that's just always great. In fact, sometimes we have a uh, little more volunteers than we might need, but we won't turn anyone down. <laughs> no such thing as too many. That's right, Aubrey. September 25th through the 27th, the marriage seminar with Neil and Kathy Pollard here at the building. And there's some flyers around in a few places of the building. If you need any information, you're welcome to see any of the elders as well. October 17th, I think Brother Josh had put from 10 to 3, the Old Timers Day Outreach at Veterans Memorial Park there on our Facebook page. And uh, we need to continue praying for that outreach and think about that as the day approaches. I have printed out some pages at, at my home today. I'm going to see how many families we have represented here tonight, and I will hand these out once you get outside uh, this evening and when we uh, dismiss to give you an update this week in the uh, sick and the bereaved and people that are in surgery, people that are recovering from surgeries, things like that at least to get us into the first half of the week and keep uh, people on our mind and in prayer as well. We're delighted to have Brother Jeremy Teague this evening. First time that he's been leading singing here for our brothers and sisters. So Brother Jeremy, come on up. Look forward to worshiping. Hi, everyone. <laughs> All right, our first song will be page 387, Restore My Soul, and we'll be singing all three verses, page 387. <clears throat> restore my spirit, Lord, I need restore. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear God, your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, it needs restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Amen. Our next song before we have our, our scripture and prayer, we'll be singing page 677. Jesus, let us come to know you. And we'll be singing both verses. <clears throat> Jesus, let us come to know you. Let us see you face to face. Touch us, hold us, use us. Jesus, draw us. 
gentle presence when the end comes bring us home our uh, scripture uh, reading for this evening will come from 1 Samuel chapter 12 and we'll start off by reading verses 14 and 15 and then we'll go down to verses 24 and 25. You want to follow along in your pew Bibles you can find that on page 253 and 254. Again 1 Samuel chapter 12 beginning in verse 14. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord. And if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Go down to verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. Let's bow together. Holy Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom in all its fullness come. Your will be done entirely on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray, Father, in each one of our lives that, that you would allow us to embrace your kingdom and help us to embrace your whole holy will with all of our hearts, regardless of what the world does. We pray, Father, for forgiveness of our sins, which we confess. And we ask you, Lord, to strengthen us today and every day that our hearts might be fully given over to do your will, and we might have greater and greater strength to resist the temptations the devil brings our way. And we pray, Father, that you would continue to transform us inwardly, that we might not desire the evil that we have desired in the past. We thank you, Father, for this congregation of our brothers and sisters, your children, and we pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless everything that is going on here in this church, Father, every single member, all of those who are regularly our guests and those who are visiting with us tonight. We pray your rich blessings on us all and on all the work done in this place. All of our upcoming outreach activities, we pray, Father, that you would bless them with fruit. We pray, Father, uh, that you would bless our elders, bless me, bless all who are in positions of leadership here, all of our deacons, all of those who teach, all of those who are striving to make disciples and to influence and encourage others that you would grant us continued growth and wisdom, that we might understand the times and know what ought to be done in the church. We pray that you should help us to get better and better and better at ministry, that we might do a better and better and better job of reaching the lost around us and, and bringing them under the sound of the gospel and bringing them to obedience that they might be saved. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jeremy leading us in song tonight. We thank you for the privilege of being able to sing praises to your name. Thank you for John leading scripture, for Brother Michael is going to bring us the message of the hour. I'm thankful, Father, for all of the men who regularly lead and worship here, the great service that they render to us all and what they do. And I'm thankful, Father, for all of those of this congregation that continue to serve in ways that don't get a lot of public recognition, that you would help them to understand that you have not forgotten anything that they've done and will reward the things that are done in secret openly. Father, we pray for our families. We pray for all the marriages in this congregation, your blessing. We pray for the children that are growing up in this congregation, that you would help us all as a church family to be able to love them, to be able to be good examples to them, to be able to teach them, that they might grow up in your wisdom and in your discipline, that if it is your will that your son's return should be delayed, that the next generation of this church will be stronger than this one. And so, Father, we ask that it might ever be until the time of your son's return. Lord, we do not ask his return to be delayed, but we would say, come, Lord Jesus. Nevertheless, your will be done. As long as you choose to be patient with this world, help us to be patient. Help us to endure hardship, to endure suffering, to be good soldiers of Christ Jesus. Help us to continue soldiering on, doing what we ought to do, Father. We pray as we continue in this worship hour 
that you would be with us, that we might worship you with our whole hearts in spirit and in truth. We pray for each who has been mentioned as having upcoming surgeries or recoverings from surgery, those that have lost loved ones, your blessing of comfort upon them. And Father, we thank you so much for our new sister in Christ, Jasmine. We pray, Father, that uh, we would be able to watch many, many more times in the coming days souls putting on your son in baptism. We ask this prayer in his sweet name. Amen. Our song before uh, we will have our, uh, our lesson this evening will be singing page 489. We'll be singing first, second, and fourth verse. For those who can, shall we stand, please? <clears throat> song will be page 925 page 925 thank you brother Jeremy for the excellent song leading tonight a great job for your first night. When you look up the word or the phrase respect for God, when you Google it um, on the internet, specifically respect for God and honor for his word, you find very first article listed in many of the articles listed are by brothers from our brotherhood, ministers of the churches of Christ, members of the Church of Christ. The church is known for holding this book, the Bible, the Word, in very high esteem. Um, I'd like to thank the elders tonight for giving me this opportunity to share God's Word with you, to share this subject with you that is um, something that's very deep um, in my thoughts and my studies lately is respecting and honor for God in his word. Um, we as a church, we are known as somebody who highly esteems, who honors, who respects God, who respects his word. But 
This is something we can do better at, something that we need to look at each and every day to highly esteem God's word, to continue to study it, to continue to place it on the pedestal it deserves to be placed at. Um, I titled this as Respect, Reverence, Honor for God in His Word. Um, with the subject matter I'm going to look at tonight, I could have also titled it Respecting God and You Can Gain a Kingdom or Disrespecting God and You Can Lose a Kingdom. When we look at the news today, look at the internet today, look at social media, newspapers, everything around us, we see that our nation, possibly our world, at least an enormous population of it, has lost respect for all authority, lost respect for the police, lost respect for political leaders, lost respect for teachers, lost respects for parents, for mothers, for fathers, for our grandparents. We lost respect for our church leaders, our ministers, our elders, and this is something that should not be. This is something that if we, number one, respected God, if we honored God, if we honored his word, everything else would fall in place. Amen. And a lot of thought out there about, and, and it's true, uh, a lot of this disrespect comes from people who do not have both a father and mother teaching them uh, that there is cause and effect that if you respect somebody, you will be respected. Your punishment, there is punishment out there to teach you that if you do something wrong, this is to set you right. If you put your hand on a hot stove, it's going to burn. We're going to tell you that and tell you that over and over again. If you go ahead and put your hand on that hot stove, you're going to be burnt. But we as a church, we have to evangelize everyone to teach the honor of God, even in those situations where people are coming from backgrounds where they haven't had the parents or grandparents to lead them, to teach them the Bible, to teach them the respect for God, to teach them the respect for his word. God's word has been severely disregarded by society today. We're living in a culture where individuals think that it's up to me to know, it's up to me and my feelings, what's right, what's wrong, and I'm going to go with what I think. Uh, nobody can tell me how I should live my life and so forth, which we know we have to be submissive, submissive to our maker, submissive to God so that we live a life that is honorable and live a life that is one that has a mindset on inheriting his kingdom and honoring his son. Matthew 24, 35, our Lord speaks saying, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus tells us that his word will not change one bit it will not change no matter what year it is. It will not change depending upon what culture or what's popular. Jesus' word will not change. It did not change yesterday. It will not change today. It will not change forever. Even when this earth has passed away, Jesus' word will last. And it's going to be everlasting, unchanging, non-negotiable. It's always alive. It is always relevant. Looking at some definitions of three words which are pretty much synonymous, respect, honor, and reverence. Respect, it is a feeling of deep admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. It is due regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. To respect is to admire someone or something deeply as a result of their abilities, qualities, and achievements. Who can we respect more than God Almighty and His Son Jesus who came to this earth and died for us? Amen. Who more can we honor, honor, high respect, great esteem, 
adherence to what is right or to a conventional standard of conduct, something regarded as a rare opportunity in bringing pride and pleasure, a privilege, reverence, deep respect for someone or something. We think of reverence, we should think of God. We think of the term reverend. The Bible only uses the word reverend once and it is in used to describing God. He is the one who we should hire, hold as reverend over everybody, over everything. And he is the only true and living person that we should live our lives by. Paul writes to the Philippians in Philippians 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. When I speak of the church, of us holding high esteem, honor, respect for God's word, that is holding a, a healthy fear of God's word a healthy fear of what God can do for us or what he can do to condemn us and punish us, a healthy fear of how God can hold us in his favor while we're still on this earth in our daily lives, the way he protects us, provides for us and our families, and even a greater fear of being condemned to hell, but even that, even more than that, a greater motivation of living our lives in thanksgiving to him that we can spend an eternity with him in heaven. To be able to praise him, to be able to praise his son forever and ever. As Josh told us a, a few weeks ago, we do not hold and honor God in high esteem. If we do not rec respect his word, then this world is just going to be chaos. We are taught to be submissive to God. By being submissive is the way that we live in an order, in the order that God has set for us, in the path that he has set for us in honoring his word and following each and every commandment, following it fully, not partially, not rationalizing our sins to make those things that we do wrong, make them in our own minds as being right because as I said before, God's word is not negotiable. It is something you have to be submissive to. Amen. The crux of our lesson tonight is going to be in 1 Samuel. I want to look at God's first two appointed kings of Israel. These were two imperfect men, but they had uh, two contrasting outcomes. I want to look specifically at a time frame of the transition between King Saul and King David and they were both appointed or anointed by God but one respected God fully and one partially respected and dishonored God. The people of Israel had requested and wanted a king to the disappointment of both God and to the prophet Samuel. God gives in to the people of Israel and decides he's going to allow them to have a king in which Saul is the first one to be anointed king. But God, in his announcement to Israel, gave them warnings about the king, about the basically the harm that a king can cause or the good that a king can provide to the people he leads. If you will, turning your Bibles to 1 Samuel, we'll look at chapter 10, verse 1, and 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 15. This was uh, Saul being appointed or anointed king by both Samuel the prophet, and by the people of Israel. First Samuel 10, 1 Samuel 10.1 Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on its 
on his head and kissed him and said, It is not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. That's as he is anointed king by Samuel. Is he not, and then he becomes anointed king by the people of Israel, 1 Samuel eleven fifteen. 15. So all the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. There they made sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord, and there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Then Saul gives the, the warnings and the promise to the people of God's commands concerning the king, which was our scripture reading tonight that John read to us. 1 Samuel 12, 14 and 15. Samuel speaking the words of God to the people. If you fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and do not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you will continue following the Lord your God. However, if you do not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. The Lord is telling the people that the king has to respect the Lord God if they're going to have the blessings of God. If he rebels, if he does not respect and fully respect the commandments of God, then they're in trouble. 1 Samuel 12, 24 through 25, continuing this thought, only the fear of the Lord, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you, but if you still do wickedly, you will, shall be swept away, both you and your king. These were conditional promises for the people to be led fairly if they followed God and if their king followed God, and warnings if they did not. Samuel gives instructions from God to Saul in 1 Samuel 10, verses 6 through 8, starting in verse 6. The Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them, and be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal. Samuel saying he will go down before Samuel to Gilgal. And surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. This was God's command through Samuel to Saul. So Saul and the people of Israel go to battle against the Philistines. Saul comes to Gilgal. The people of Israel are in fear. They go, they hide in caves. Some cross the Jordan. Some flee. Some hide. And that's the situation that is Saul is facing. And Saul knows this command that was given to him by God from Samuel earlier. This is how Saul responds. 1 Samuel 13, 7 through 14. And some of the Hebrews cross over to the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. As for Saul, he was still in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Then he waited seven days according to the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul said, Bring a burnt offering and peace offering here to me, and he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came, and Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, The Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. 
but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord has commanded you. Let's look back and see what Saul did not do. Samuel had told him, he did wait the seven days, but he said that Samuel would come and offer the burnt offerings, and for Saul to wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. We saw later on in the passage that, Sam rash, that uh, Saul rationalized what the Lord had told him and rationalized his not fully following the commands of the Lord when he went and did the burnt offerings himself instead of waiting on Samuel to come and to do the burnt offerings and tell him what needed to be done. By his not fully respecting the Lord, his God's commandments, he lost the kingdom. We have a kingdom today that we are part of that we can lose if we do not fully strive to obey all the commands and all the words of the Lord. Because these words, as you see in the, even though Saul was anointed as king, chosen by God, God's words are not negotiable. You cannot rationalize in your own mind and change what God has commanded you. Saul's second recorded sin, 1 Samuel 15, we're told that God was angry at the Amalekites because they had attacked Israel when they came past from Egypt, and God wanted Saul to attack the Amalekites to utterly destroy them. Uh, when he said utterly destroy them, he wanted Saul to go in to kill every man, every woman, every baby, and to kill every single member, every single one of their livestock, their ox, their sheep, their donkeys, um, camels, and ox, to kill every single one of them. We know that Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 15 tells us, Saul went in and he destroyed all the Amalekites but he didn't utterly destroy them. He kept King Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive against the Lord's commandment. He also kept the choice members of their livestock alive and did not fully follow God's commandments. And again, God regret, at this point, God had regretted making Saul the king over Israel. 1 Samuel 15 verses 10 and 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel, even though he knew that Saul had done wrong, he was hurting, he was hurting for Saul, and he cried out to the Lord. But the Lord has made his decision, and really Saul made his decision. Saul is the one who did not obey, so it was really on Saul for losing the kingdom. 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delights, has the Lord as great delights in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has rejected you from being king. So God has rejected Saul from being king. At this point, God is ready to anoint David king. David doesn't fully become king yet, but... Just to give you the background uh, of this, we know that David was the son of Jesse, that Samuel went through the process of going through Jesse's sons until he came to David after going through the other brothers, and he picked David knowing he was a man after his own heart. 
David is anointed king in 1 Samuel 16, verses 13 and 14. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David, and from that day forward, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. There's a parallel to this today, one that we focused on this morning in Acts 2, verses 38 and 39. As David became king, the Lord fell upon him. As we become Christians, or the Spirit of the Lord, as we become Christians, we inherit the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38 and 39. Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God, our God will call. We'll save this for a little bit later in the lesson. At this point, David had killed Goliath, uh, at least in the order that Samuel is written. Don't know exactly if it was chronologically, but David had killed Goliath, and he attacked and slaughtered the Philistines and the women of Israel sang and said that Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed the ten thousands. At this point, Saul hated David. He let his jealousy drive hate between him and David. Also, Saul pretty much knew at this point that David was going to be the next king and his jealousy and his hate drove him to repeatedly try to kill David from that point forward. Saul attempts to kill David multiple times. Big difference here that we see between David and Saul is that David was considered someone who did all that the that God wanted him to do, respected and honored his word. Even in battle, Saul himself noticed that David did what was right. And Saul knew that he would be the king because he knew that David fully respected and honored God, kept his commandments, but Saul did not. Even though these were both imperfect men, the heart of David was fully engaged with the will of God where Saul's was not. First example of Saul attempting to kill David, 1 Samuel 18, verses 10 and 11. And it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul, and he prophesied inside the house. So David played music with his hand, as other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand, and Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall, but David escaped his presence twice. Saul continued to pursue David and to kill him multiple times. Twice he had the opportunity right here to kill him, but was not successful. Two other occasions that Saul pursued David, and David had the opportunity presented right in his hands, as easy as can be, that he could have took out Saul, but he didn't. The reason he didn't is because David... Even though this would take the stress off his life, the stress of somebody pursuing him and killing him, is David respected God. He expected God's anointed in King Saul with great respect, great esteem that he even held off his own troops to keep from coming in and killing Saul. 1 Samuel 24, verses 3 through 7. So he came to the sheepfold by the road where there was a cave, and Saul went in to attend to his needs. David and his man were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the man of David said to him, This is the day which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. This even troubled David that he had cut the robe of Saul because he was the Lord's anointed out of David's respect of him being God's anointed. 
And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with these words and did not allow them to rise again against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. And we know after that that Saul proclaimed, that David proclaimed to Saul, showed him the piece of the garment, and Saul said, is that you, David? David said, yes, um, and basically said, I want you to see how close I was to killing you and could have killed you, but you are the God's anointed. I respect him, even though Saul didn't. The respect that David had for God is that he spared his life. A second time, First Samuel 26, starting in verse 7. So David in Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul lay sleeping within the camp, with his spear stuck in the ground by his head, and Abner and the people lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, for, now therefore, please let me strike him at once with a sword, right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, for his day shall come to die, and he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please, take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head, and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away, and no man saw or knew it or awoke, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Again, David goes to a hilltop opposite Saul and calls out to him, shows him the spear, shows him the jug of water, and that he could have easily killed him. But out of his respect for God, for God's anointed, for God's commands, his full respect, he did not kill God's anointed. At that point, Saul, again, basically acts like he's, David would be his ally, but Saul continued to pursue David into, into Saul's death, which was not at the hand of David, but was in, in battle along with Saul's son, Jonathan. So we see one man, David, respected God, honored him fully. Another man had been appointed by God saw, but he did not fully respect God's word. He took matters into his own hand instead of following the commands of God, instead of waiting on Samuel to come and perform the sacrifice and tell him what he needed to do. Instead of killing every one of the Amalekites, he spared some against God's command. He did not fully respect God's word. Yet David, in his heart, fully respected God in all things. Acts 13.22, New Testament reference to David. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. David didn't partially respect God, but David did all his will. David fully respected God and was considered a man after his own heart. As we see the, the kingdom of Israel, as it splits through the split of Israel and Judah in the following kings, kings of Israel, who was not really any kings of Israel that were known as good kings when you, when you think of the word good as compared to how they honor God. Then you look at the line of the kings of Judah leading up to the Babylonian captivity. Four out of 20 were known as really good kings. There were a few who had mixed bags, but four out of the 20 were known as really good kings of God because they honored God's commands, they honored God's words, and they did what they 
were supposed to do. They did not respect the foreign gods. They tore down the, the temples. They tore down the idols. And they respected the Lord God. Asa, in 1 Kings 15, 9 through 24, is the story of Asa. God blessed him because he honored the Lord his God by getting rid of the false idols in the temple and the surrounding areas. And he was blessed by forming an alliance with Syria to defeat the evil king Basha of Israel. Basha had built a fortress so nobody could come to or leave out to visit Asa. And because of God's favor, because Asa was a good king and led the people in a righteous way, he was able to tear down the fortress access to Judah, was tore down, and he was called a man whose heart was loyal to the Lord. King Jehoshaphat, 1 Kings 22, verses 41 through 50, is the king's story, the story in Kings. There's also more in Chronicles about King Jehoshaphat. King Jehoshaphat also was the son of Asa, and he continued to rid the area of Judah of what was uh, known as perverts of the, of the area because they worshipped kings or worshipped idols, false idols. He continued to destroy whatever idols were left after his father Asa. And he did not turn aside from doing good what was right in the sight of the Lord. One thing that is said about all four of the kings, including Hezekiah and Josiah that I'll mention, is that these four kings respected God as the only true and living God, even though surrounding areas worshipped idols, worshipped false gods, false practices. It says that these four kings, they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. King Hezekiah held fast to the Lord. He destroyed the false idols, unlike the first two, even went and destroyed the idols they had in the high places. So did King Josiah years after him. Because King Hezekiah was a king that was loyal to the Lord, he blessed the people of Judah, as did King Asa, King Josaphat, and King Josiah. The Lord prospered him, Hezekiah, whenever he went out. Israel was taken captive, but God saved Judah from the Assyrian attack and captivity, and God also granted Hezekiah an additional 15 years of his life after he was at the point of death. King Josiah. Oh, I wish America would have a King Josiah today. Amen. Someone who went, he repaired the damage to the temple. They found the Holy Scrolls of God. They found the, the Law of Moses, the Old Covenant. His great respect for the Word of God brought forth him having the priests read these words to all the people of Israel. He read the Old Covenant to the people of Israel. They repented. He removed and he destroyed idols. He restored the Passover feast in observance, uh, the observance of the Passover feast in the traditions of the laws of Moses. He made Judah a land of God again, even though at this point it was pretty much too late. At that time, he blessed Judah. He blessed the people. He brought a revival. And King Josiah, along with the other three kings, because of their godly leadership, brought the blessings of God upon their nation. Looking to the New Testament again, Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Today, people will say that the Bible is a antiquated, useless book, a relic that today's culture defines what's good and what's bad, or today's culture in our feelings can influence God and the words can be changed to their liking so that the Bible basically has no rule today because it can be changed as they define right and wrong, as they 
want to self-justify their lives. But as this verse says in previous verse, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word does not change one bit, one iota, as we saw before. It does not change. It does not change in the past. It does not change now. It will not change forever. No matter what a political candidate tells you, no matter what a superstar in sports or music or media tell you and want to describe to you and want to be your role model, Jesus is the only role model. He's the only one who will be forever, and he does not change. Speaking of kings, after the Babylonian captivity, kings existed, but the Romans came in. The Romans took control, but we have an eternal king. Our eternal king, unlike Saul, unlike David, unlike all the other kings of Israel or Judah, he was not, is not, and never will be imperfect. He is a perfect king. He is the Lord. He is our God. He lived a perfect life on this earth, never once falling to sin, never once falling to the temptations of Satan. We have him to respect. We have him to look up to. And we have him to hold as king, as king of our kingdom, which is the Church of Christ. 2 Timothy 2.5 tells us that the origin of the Bible is God and that we are to be diligent to present yourselves approved to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Every day we need to look into God's word. Every day we need to spend some time into his word so that we continue to hold it in high esteem, to apply it to our lives, to give us sanity from chaos. We need God's word. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Even though the Bible was written by several different men, several different apostles, the brothers of Jesus, the prophets of old, the prophets who tried to tell the people of Judah and people of Israel, you're going to be taken into captivity either Assyrian captivity or Babylonian captivity if you don't change your ways, and they would not change their ways. These were the words of God and they were inspired by God. So even though man's hand has written the Bible, God's hand is the one who directed their writing of the Bible. Second Thessalon- First Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this reason we also thank God without ceasing But you received the word of God, which you heard from us. You welcomed it, not as the word of man, but as in truth, the word of God, which also effectively effectively works in you who believe. The Bible is the word of God. It is the truth. You hear a lot of popular singers say, what is truth? There is no truth. We have the truth. We have the whole truth, which is God's word, the full truth. The Bible tells us everything, pertains everything to our life. We have the truth. We need to hold it in high esteem, and we need to continually heighten that pedestal of what God's word means to us, and that it is our map of life and how we should live. God's word is our foundation, standard of judgment, and it lives, it forever lives, and it's forever relevant. Matthew 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words or hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. A foolish man, like Samuel told Saul, he was not fu- for fully not obeying God's word. 
And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. God's word is our foundation, the true, the living foundation that forever stands. John 12, 48, he who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The word, the word of God is our standard of judgment. It is what will be what we are judged by will be what we must live for and what we will have to answer to. Thank God he sent his son that we can have the grace and mercy and the forgiveness of his blood, that we can have that intermediary and have the atonement for our sins through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made these, who also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Just as Jesus lives and sits at the right hand of God in heaven, the word of God lives and is relevant in our lives always, forever, even beyond the grave. Quickly, I want to read to you. I spoke of uh, Googling respect for God in his word. I want to read a quote from Mike Vest Vestal, brother Mike Vestal, uh, one of our brothers at, that he spoke at Polishing the Pulpit in July 2017. We must ever keep the following truth in mind. Low views of scriptures do not lend themselves to high views of God, salvation, or the church. The Bible is a book by God, about God, and the relationship he wants us to have, and the relationship he wants to have with us. In a very real sense, we are what we eat. Matthew 4.4, 4, Colossians 3.16. Speaking as the Bible speaks is more than a slogan for the churches of Christ. It is intended to be a way of life. 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. I would suspect that among Christians today, the problem generally is not too much respect for the scriptures, but too little. It is right for the churches of Christ to have a deep respect for the word of God because when scripture is properly read, taught, or preached, God is spoken. It is right for the churches of Christ to have a great reverence for the word of God because the faithful of all the ages have. From Abraham to Moses to David to Jesus to Peter to John and Paul, it is right to highly regard and esteem the Bible because we cannot plead with the people to be the people of God today without bold, loving proclamation of the message of God. Church leaders, gospel preachers, and teachers, one of the most beautiful things about the churches of Christ is the sincere desire of the people to be people of the book fearing nothing but the awfulness of sin and desiring nothing but the glory of God. Let's fill our pulpits, Bible classes, homes, and world with the so-saving message of God. Amen. Tonight, if you have not put on Christ, if you have not gained the gift that comes through baptism of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit that fell upon Saul, and then fell upon David, it falls upon us today in a, in a sense of comfort, in a sense of his word, in a sense of knowing that we've been forgiven of our sins because Jesus came to this earth and died for us. If you've not put on Christ in baptism, as it says in Galatians 3.27, in Acts 2.38, we invite you tonight to come, or if you have any other needs, please come as we stand and sing.
Uh, for those uh, who didn't take the opportunity for the Lord's Supper to my left and the library will be prepared for you. Uh, while we sing this next song, page 591. Page 591, and we will be singing first and fourth verse. <clears throat> when upon Father God, we thank you so much for this day you've given us. So thankful for the powerful messages that we have heard. We're thankful for your word, Father, and for all that you continue to do for us. We're so thankful for our sister Jasmine and her decision today. So rejoicing in that, and we know you are as well in the host of heaven. We pray that you be with all of us as we leave this place tonight. Help us to serve you faithfully throughout this week at our jobs, at school, amongst those that uh, we meet and those who we see daily help us to be the light be the salt help us to proclaim your name and the gospel of jesus christ we pray this prayer in jesus name amen amen, amen. Oh, yeah. you're dismissed <laughs> <laughs>